let's come back then to the Title uh, II trial where patients started on imatinib 600 and then um, certain things caused them to switch and, and what showed up from that trial? Why would they switch and what did we learn? I think the key points from the title studies were that if you start with imantinib or even an escalated dose of imantinib and then optimize by looking at some things that are a bit novel, looking at the plasma levels, which isn't um, routinely done, but I think is probably provocative and, and useful. But then talking about milestones, I mean, the, the things we've learned, early molecular response or uh, later milestones. Um, so if you start with a uh, imantinib or a higher, higher, higher dose of imantinib, intermediate dose of imantinib population, in the end, five-year data, you're going to wind up switching at least a third of patients. I think the data showed that the um, patients who missed early milestones did not very well. So ba based, based on our conversation so far, we know that uh, we probably can relax a little bit once a patient gets into uh, early response and has you know, good early reduction and be a little bit less uh, demanding when it comes to how, how quickly do you get a major molecular emission, as long as it uh, hopefully occurs, and then more importantly, maybe you know, what, is the, what is the role of a deep molecular emission, although there's clearly a role. But um, the ability to switch um, and, and optimize patients um, was good, but a little bit more limited in the early, early failures and a little bit better in the later failures. But I think in the end it showed us that that's, an, that's another path forward, mm -hmm. that you could start with imantinib and, and optimize and have similar or even slightly better success. But again, with all the trappings of having uh, very meticulous follow-up and very careful uh, optimization at, at key time points. Uh, and uh, I'll make a comment because um, when you look at the cumulative incidence of MR4.5 on the Tidal 2, um, it is remarkably similar to the cumulative uh, incidence of MR 4.5 at five years from facetinib or nilotinib, uh, very, very similar. Um, however, let's not forget that this was imatinib 600. It's not imatinib 400. And when you, when you put the cumulative incidence of, of uh, MR 4.5 with imatinib 400 and imatinib 600, it's not the same. You know, we've done these studies with, we use imatinib 800, um, and, and without the early intervention and all of that, it looks remarkably similar to Tidal 2. Um, and when you look at the German study, the CML4, and they look at the imatinib 800, it looks remarkably similar to Tidal 2. So there is a question mark there. Was this the early intervention, or was that the higher doses of imatinib? And we don't have the answer. Uh, so, but, but it also begs the question as to whether that applies to imatinib 400 and early intervention. So we don't know those answers because the study, and that's the only one that's been shown results on this early intervention, is imatinib 600 with an early switch to nilotinib. Uh, they actually had the first cohort was first increased to 800 and, and whatever. So, so that, you know, that's a question mark that we need to be aware of, that, that this, is, this is early intervention, but starting with imatinib 600. But back to your point, though. I mean, a lot of people in the, around the world use imatinib. So I think it... Yeah, and actually, it's enough evidence for, to convince me to use intermediate dose of imatinib even in the U.S. as an initial treatment option. Not, it's not label, and it's not for everybody. Oh, uh, but, but I think it's, it, you know, it's an option, and it might be a good option around the world. Although clearly, the second generation inhibitors. I don't think I have to tell you that that's what I use. <laughs> okay, so okay, but let me tell you what my concern remains about that approach of starting with imatinib, and then moving based on a poor response at three months or six months to. Um, a second generation drug. And my concern is, is that in every single trial of an able, of interferon, we'll start with interferon, and then with the able TKIs, the highest rates of progression occur in the first six to 12 months. They occur early on. My feeling is, is that, especially for the higher risk patients, but in CML, start with your best drug because, again, my goal is to prevent progression. So one of my concerns about Title II and I tried to weed through the data and what happened to all the patients, there were a small number of patients who actually progressed during that first three to six month period. And it's, it's never gonna be statistically significant, but when it happens to one of our patients, it's gonna be devastating. Well, um, the rate of transformation is pretty low when you start, when you use the higher doses of imatinib. So, you know, if we're gonna use the higher doses of imatinib, uh, I have not such a concern. To me, the concern is more that 
we know that unfortunately the monitoring is not appropriate. We, you know, there's a series that has shown that in the U.S. at least, at any of the recommended given time points for monitoring, only about 30% of patients are monitored. So if you're so highly dependent on the on those outcomes to decide on a switch and, and, and whatever, well, if you're going to miss them, then you're, you're going to miss opportunities. And you're going to, you know, who, we don't know what that represents. But, you know, Mike emphasized the fact that this was in a highly controlled setting and where, there, you know, all these patients were monitored and whatever. If you do it that way, um, at least you have that level of protection. If you're going to miss them, 